can see your butt. It can see your butt, man. You're just chilling over there, Sydney. You're just chilling. It's a lovely shot of your bottom in this picture. Helps if I've got the right page open, doesn't it? It's right in front of you. Okay, sensible time, Matt. Hello, folks. Hello. I still don't feel like I did that right. I'm clearly not in the zone today. Blah, blah, blah. Hello, folks. Welcome to the All Good Things vlog with myself, Scaramouche, and Sydney, who is only showing her bottom today. I've lost a few marbles in this lockdown. And this is the All Good Things vlog. Welcome to week 27 of my study vlog and my positive notes as well. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm going a little bit stir crazy with staying indoors and staying away from people. You wouldn't think it because I'm quite a, a uh, social mouse in terms of I like my indoors and I'll go and see people occasionally and then I'll go back to the indoors for a few years. But there's a family in Grimes, Iowa who have been on Fox 13 News for doing something quite special. They've created a board game out of the sidewalks on their streets and their community and they've made it a certain board game beginning with the letter M. I'm not going to say the full name just in case copyright is out to get me at any point but the game in question has certain blocks and houses, hotels and you cannot pass go, you will go directly to prison if you do, that sort of thing. You know which one I'm talking about, right? And they've created this game on their sidewalks. It was created by the Earps family. The children of the family created it on a Sunday. It took them about four hours. It shows some real creative ingenuity and it looks like the, the board. It's, it's really impressive. I'll just show you a few more photos. And I'm pretty sure it took them much longer to play it because that is a long game, especially considering you have to do a bit of exercise to do it this time round as well. So I thought I'd feature them in my positive notes because they've shown creativity and ingenuity during this time. They're getting that exercise, but they're also having a bit of fun while they're doing it. That's worthy of a positive note. So there we go. Positive note for today. Now on to my study vlog. Study week 27, which was about a South African play called The Island. And The Island is a play that was created during the time of the South African apartheid. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I just wanted to stop the idiot there because he seems to have forgotten a few of the details and gotten a little bit emotional, bless him. Hello, it's me. Yep, me. You see, I realised when I was listening to him, while my butt was apparently on the screen, that he was missing a few of the important details about the apartheid. So I thought I'd just step in and give you a few quick facts, and then I'll let him waffle on about... What was he talking about? I don't know, I wasn't listening. Were you? Let's start by going back a few centuries first. Before the 16th century, there were indigenous groups in South Africa. They spoke languages such as Zoa and Zulu. 
and then in 1652, Dutch settlers arrived in the Cape. They started mining, and they realised that there was gold and diamond in the hills in places such as Johannesburg and Kimberley. Ooh, that's a thought I could do with a gold collar, actually. Sorry, sorry, lost my train of thought there. So anyway, they brought with them religion, and there were missionaries that came to South Africa and settled and opened institutions, such as the Lovedale Missionary Institution. The people were taught the language of English and Dutch, as well as songs and plays, and Antigone was one of those. Moving ahead just a little bit, in 1912, the African National Congress came together to organise a group that could hold a political power. And they wanted a group that was mainly the people of Africa, people who had the same skin colour as the people who'd been there in the indigenous groups. But of course, by that point, the white settlers, the Dutch and the Europeans, who had made their home there by now, also had a party, the Africans National Party, who wanted to ensure that they stayed in power in South Africa. The ANC, the African National Congress, nearly got enough votes to go into power, and the Africans National Party beat them to it. The Africans National Party didn't really like that the Africans National Congress had tried to beat them at the voting game, so they started to lay down laws that put people who were a different colour to the whites into different categories and ensured that they lost the power that would have given them the ability to raise a party and have control of South Africa. In 1948, the white nationalist government set up laws that would become the apartheid. And the man who dreamt this up, Henrik Verwood, became Minister for Native Affairs in 1950, and by 1958, he was Prime Minister. He implemented the Population Regulation Act and the legislative framework for the apartheid. Ethnic and tribal groups had to develop their own culture, live with their own people, for what they called the betterment of all. The Population Regulation Act was set up in the 1950 and saw that South Africans were racially classed by their appearance. The police enforced it, and any non-whites carrying a pass had to identify themselves. Those carrying the pass often called it the dumb pass, which meant stupid pass. Other laws came into effect after this. There was the Prevention of Illegal Squatting Act, which meant that evictions and demolitions occurred to remove black people from white people's land. There was the Reservation of Separate Amenities Act in 1953, which meant that ethnic people had to sit in different places to white people on things such as buses, trains and even toilets. And then there was the Riotous Assemblies Act in 1956 and its amendment in 1974. This was created to prevent gatherings of groups in open spaces and later any groups bigger than five or six people to stop a risk of the peace. This meant that People couldn't gather to watch things such as music or plays. And that one's important to this, I think, isn't it? In 1964, the ANC was prominent and one of its leaders, Nelson Mandela, opposed the apartheid and became sentenced to life in imprisonment on Robin Island and other prisons. Yet it continued to inspire black Africans. One group that was inspired was a group called the Serpent Players. They were a group of amateur actors and they were led by a playwright named Athel Fugards and a few other actors such as John Canny, Winston Nishona and Norman Nishinga. In 1964 they were due to play the Antigone. However, as they were performing, police burst into the venue and arrested several of the actors based on the Separate Amenities Act and the Riotous Assemblies Act. Mishinga and Kani's brother were some of those who were arrested and they were sent to Robin Island. Okay, I think I'm all caught up there and I think I can let the idiot continue from this point onwards. Thank you for listening and I will uh, try and encourage him to get me a gold collar. So this play was created during this time. 
and it was in protest and as a sort of rallying call. In 1973, Fugard set out a blanket and he asked the two actors to step onto the blanket and to use it in a way that became a natural form of theatre. So immediately what they did was they brought in the corners, they made it a lot smaller and they made it into a space, a floor for a jail cell. And they made it so that it was claustrophobic. So it felt like they only had that space to hold all next to each other. And from that small space, they created the play The Island. Now, when they created it, they didn't initially write down a script for it. Each performance, they had an idea of what they wanted to perform and how they were going to get from one to the other, from A to B, but they wanted to perform it naturally. And the play itself, when it was eventually written down, is about two men who are in a prison, very similar to a prison on uh, Robin Island. It's the same place where Nelson Mandela, when he was jailed, and these two men go by the same names as the actors, John and Winston, because again, they wanted it to feel like a natural performance. So by taking their own personal names, it became natural. It's about these two men. It starts off with a scene with no speech. It's just these two men in a labour camp. And as one is digging, another one is wheeling a wheelbarrow. Of course, this is all imaginary. It's all played as though it's there. And it's for the audience to fill in the gaps, to fill in the props that are there. And it gets to the end of the day and they're shifted from this labour camp. They're forced to run with their legs shackled together into their cell. And that's when the speech starts. There was a relationship where one was keeping the other alive and vice versa. They're going to perform a play in front of the Hochi and in front of the other inmates that are at the prison and the officers that are looking after it as well. Now the Hochi is the warden of the prison. They are named after a carrier fly. The Hochi is the uh, is kind of like a derogatory term, but because the warden is white, doesn't quite understand that that's a derogatory term used against them. They think it's a term of endearment or respect, um, or at least that's what I gathered when I was reading this. So they're going to perform for this man and they choose the play Antigone, which is what links into the previous chapter that I was studying. They're going to perform this play and they are rehearsing the lines, but Winston, I believe, is struggling to understand the the story. He's trying to relate it because it's not one that he's heard before. John is more learned, more um, capable of remembering the lines. But with Winston, it comes to the case that he is being taught it by John, which in one sense is used as a way of forgetting everything that's going on around them. In another sense, it's used as a driving tool towards their main goal, which is to eventually get out of there and be able to have a free life. So Winston struggles with the bit, struggles with the line, struggles with the plot, and John gets frustrated with him. I should say that before this, you see Winston as more of the frustrated character. They come back to the cell and they find that they have numerous wounds and it's Winston who wants to go out and beat the, the Hochi and, and fight for all of the inflictions that have been put upon them. But during this scene, it's more John that's um, having the arguments and wants things to be correct and right. And they do get the lines right eventually, then they go to bed. 
and as they go to bed you find John again using imagery and um, acting in order to keep Winston's spirits up. He pretends to be going to the place where they used to live before they were imprisoned and fakes a phone call with his missus and arranges to meet up with some friends and find some women in the night and have a bit of fun, blah, 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 blah. And this keeps Winston's spirits up till the, uh, till the next day. The next day they found a few items while they were working and they've created a wig of sorts because one of them has to play Antigone who is a female character and of course that that character ends up being Winston who is very frustrated about having to play a person in a dress. It's uh, very difficult for him but it turns out that that's another driving point of the plot where John reassures him that his colleagues, his inmates, his friends are going to laugh at him, yes, but then they're going to listen to what he says and they're going to realise that it's important and it's not just a joke. So Winston is, it takes some convincing for him and there's several occasions where he still tells John that he's not going to play the part. But as they're having this discussion, the Hochi turns up and has John escorted out of the cell. And there's a tense moment where Winston's on his own and you're wondering what's going to happen to John. Is he going to be, is, it, is something horrible going to happen to him? But he does return. And when he returns, he returns with the news that he's been given time off of his sentence and is actually going to be sent home. And there's a moment of joy for John that Winston shares with him. And that moment soon changes because you realise that while John is being freed, Winston remains and could remain for the rest of his life in prison. And there's a strange feeling of bitterness, but also hope and happiness, but also anger. And the two struggle to, to share that information to, but seem to both understand and relate to each other. And eventually Winston has to push past it and tell him to stop worrying. Not because he'll be okay, but because it's inevitable. Their fates are inevitable. Then you get to the point where they are performing for the inmates and for the Hochi. And it starts off as a normal performance of Antigone. You've got John playing the part of Creed. Uh, Creed? You're lucky. Uh, Creon. John playing the part of Creon. And you've got uh, Winston playing the part of Antigone. And they perform the speech where Antigone tells Creon that she did bury her brother and that she'd do it again. And Creon's defying her and saying that she was wrong to do this act, that she is going against her people and her state and going against the people who are enforcing the state. And then you start to realise as this bit comes about that actually what they're talking about is what's happening in South Africa because you have people there who have stepped in to enforce what's happening in South Africa and you have people who are being forced to live the way they are being told. And the scene ends very poignantly with Winston turning to the audience, speaking to the audience as though they're another character and taking off the wig and the and everything else that's been used so far to show him as being Antigone. And he speaks to them as Winston and tells them that the only way that they are going to be free of this is if they themselves change the situation and that there needs to be an action.
reaction for there to be a reaction. The play then goes back to the start where they are back in the labouring and working and having to run in chains and shows that at the moment things are inevitable. Things don't change, things aren't changing because there is a higher power that shouldn't be in power at that point in time. The island when it was performed couldn't be performed on stage. It had to be hidden and had to be treated as though people were joining, were going to that place simply to enjoy a religious activity. And so when it was found out that anybody was putting on any performances, whether it was of the island or whether it was of Antigone or anything else, then any attempts to perform that were instantly squashed by the authorities. There were many, many other events that happened in South Africa and eventually the people who were performing the island were able to perform it in other places as well. Fugard, Kani and Nishona were invited to London to put on a performance of the island. They did so and immediately when the information got back to Africa that they would put on this performance then they were promised that they would be reprimanded when they returned to their own country. But luckily they were able to continue to perform this in many other areas. They were able to perform it in America and across Europe as well. And as they did so, they got the word out about apartheid. They weren't the only people who were doing so, but their contribution helped people to see what was going on in Africa, what was happening to the people of colour, and to want to change it. It was controversial. It shows that this crossing of boundaries from a meaning in one land to a meaning in another was something that became important. In 1990, things did start to change. You had Nelson Mandela become the, the first black president of South Africa. You saw many other people recognised for their sacrifices. Because on Robin Island, there were people who were executed for the colour of their skin for fighting for what they felt was right, for fighting for their own freedom and for the freedom of the people they cared about, their family, their friends, their race. And so things did change. So I'm going to leave you with this question on this chapter. If you could go back and look at how you've treated somebody just because you didn't like their face or you didn't like who they were or who people told you they were or maybe something stronger maybe it was something that you later looked on and wished you felt differently how would you tell your younger self to be different, to be kinder. And I can think of one aspect. I can think of a time when I was in primary school. It wasn't a racist act, it was somebody who was same colour as me, but a little bit different. And on one hand, I treated them as a friend, as another, I listened to peer pressure and treated them in a way that was disrespectful. And if I could speak to my younger self now and tell myself that those actions I'd come to regret, but also those actions were completely out of order, then I would explain to myself that I need to put myself in that person's shoes, into that kid's shoes and just think for a moment just think about how it would feel to be on the receiving end of that 
and to realise that there are times where the shoe is on the other foot and you will realise that those actions, those ways that you've spoken to somebody just weren't right. Sometimes it takes a bit of foresight, it takes a bit of realisation from yourself to realise that you need to be different sometimes and being yourself isn't always the best thing. Being somebody better, somebody kinder, somebody more helpful does take a bit of energy but it is more rewarding at the end of the day. So on that note I'm going to leave the video here and I'm going to move on to South Africa and protest music which is the next chapter but for now I'm going to have a quick break I'm going to grab a cup of tea and I will uh, speak to you later. If you enjoyed this, please like and subscribe. Please comment. Please be kind. Stay safe out there. All good things. Let's go and out.